in your Bibles to James 1, 22 through 27. And as you open it there, um, so I have accepted a request by my oldest brother to join an NBA fantasy basketball league. Now, fantasy basketball is not the same as real basketball, because real basketball you're actually playing it, and in fantasy basketball you somehow are benefiting from someone else doing something. But in this, I keep on getting, uh, Facebook is now giving me these sports things about build your best NBA player or build the, the best NFL player, you know, this guy's arms, this guy's head, all these amalgamation of different body parts to make the perfect athlete. And in today's passage, it's interesting where I think about how you can build the best components of things, but sometimes the thing that made the athlete the best athlete was their ability to just get up, go out, and try another time after they failed. And today we're going to talk about our faith is a faith of doing. So may we be mature and wake up to the reality that when we have received the word of God, we need to then live and act out the word of God. So in James 1, 22 through 27, it builds off of last week's passage. So I'm going to read James 1, 19 through 27. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says, it's like someone who looks at his face in a mirror, and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. And whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep it, keep a tight rein on their tongues to see themselves. And their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Was it just a breaker? breaker Jeff walked downstairs and he fixed it. All right. Oh, I switched headset, so one moment. Can you hear me through this now? No? No? A headset without power is worthless. All right. It would be a whole lot easier if we did just all move up. But so this passage is what I like to call a wake up call. This passage is not an easy passage. And in fact, it stays in line with what I would say James likes to do. And it almost aggressively slaps the average believer in the face and says, would you wake up and pay attention to what you are called to be? So the first slide is just talking about a wake-up call and how we as Christians demonstrate the wisdom of God not by having a witty aphorism or a phrase, not by having the right words at the right time, but by doing or not doing something. As the previous passage that Nick talked about, we demonstrate that the word of God is in us by either not being angry or by being quick to listen. And today, this is a call to allow God's word that implants itself into us to grow into action in our life. And so, 
Verse 22 says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. This is growing out of verse 21 that's, that ends with saying, humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. The gospel message is a beautiful message that can be stated simply or elaborately, one that can be a sentence, one that can be volumes. Pointing to the reality that humanity was made to be in relationship with God, yet because of sin in the world and sin in our heart and sin in our lives, that relationship is broken. And only Jesus is able to rectify that issue. And once he has rectified that issue of overcoming sin in our life, overcoming death, breaking down all the layers, we are then called to be people who live out that gospel truth wherever we go. But interestingly enough, this passage has a, a large comment about as believers, we can hear the word, we can reflect on the word, and then oftentimes we sadly walk away as if there's no need to change. Now, I've coached junior high and high school sports, and in coaching junior high sports, one of the most amusing parts of coaching junior high boys is their complete lack of under, understanding and awareness of their self. They have no idea if their hair's in the right place. They usually smell bad, and they're celebrating the one armpit hair that started growing that week. You can show them a mirror, but usually... They see their armpit hair and they don't know how to change their life. Move forward to then dealing with high school athletes who they start to underwear, the, understand, hopefully underwear. <laughs> that too. Um, they start understanding that their body has changed, that their social dynamics, that they need to adapt a different lifestyle and then move forward. And in our life then as adults, we understand that so often we are confronted with a true mirror of who we are. And the question is, are we going to do anything about it? Now, last week the statement, be quick to listen and slow to speak. Those two statements are a great way to have an understanding of where are you. And I've mentioned the fact that our emotions and our feelings, they are not a sign of reality, but the reality of what's going on in our heart. And how often is it that we have all these emotions that are raising red flags, and we say, I'm not going to do anything about it, and I'm not going to change my life. Or further, which will be built on so many more times in this book, we see something wrong in the world, our heart spikes, we have this emotion, but we don't do anything to then meet that need. Anyone who listens to the word of God but does not do it is like someone who looks at himself in the mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But, see, this is the beauty. Scripture doesn't just speak against improper action, but it says, whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. The blessing comes in doing what you have received from the word of God. But oftentimes, we are unable to receive from the Word of God what He's calling us to do because we approach God's Word wrongly. We approach the Gospel wrongly. Now, blessing is mentioned in this passage. and People love to talk about blessing. Blessing, blessing. Well, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. So then they think, well, if I want a blessed life, then I need to follow God. And if I want this, then this. And God becomes a means, and the gospel becomes a means, and other people become a means whenever the reality, quite honestly, is that when 
we view God's word as God's word and we view God as holy and perfect. We don't approach God's word of how do I receive a blessing? We approach God's word as how do I know God, love God, worship God, and follow God. And God himself is the blessing. You see how there's a difference between using God for a blessing and God as a blessing. This is where the book of James is the blessing in the book of James where at the end he receives all the, the family and the food and the, and the livestock and the houses back? Or is the blessing the fact that in all of that story, God heard, God spoke, and the relationship was there through the whole thing. And this is where having a faith that reflects as part of asking, when I read scripture, why am I doing it? When I go to church, why am I doing it? Am I doing it to have a checklist? Am I doing it to look better? Am I doing it to have a way for people to go, hey, 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 look at you? Or do we do it because God is good? And what he calls us to do, we should do. But the wake-up call isn't just some sort of, let's talk about the philosophy of Scripture. The wake-up call is this. Pure and undefiled religion before God. The Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So the next slide is the last verse. And this is one of those verses that really, if you want to summarize up what we should be doing as Christians, what our faith should look like, what it should mean to be a follower of Jesus, it's this. It's not complicated. How do I follow Jesus better? Well, verse 26 prefaces by saying, those who consider themselves religious yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. But a religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So let's look at this concept of pure religion. Now, I know we, we fight the concept of, you know, people like to post on Facebook and on Instagram, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. Well, as someone who likes to study words and what they mean, I think we're missing the point whenever we try to contrast religion and relationship. Religion means how do you practice what you believe? How do you follow through on what you state is real? And so a pure religion, first and foremost, follows a repeated theme in the book of James. I think if you're to count all the times that speech is addressed in the book of James, you'd be very surprised. And it's very surprising that 2,000 years later, it's just as relevant now. James wrote this prior to Instagram, prior to Twitter, prior to Facebook, prior to Snapchat, prior to Threads, prior to Reddit. Is there anything else that needs to be addressed that he did this prior to? The printing press as well. What comes out of our mouth shows what our heart is. Flowing from the heart are the issues of the heart. In Matthew 15, Jesus is being confronted by the Pharisees. Hey, don't you know what your disciples are doing is going to defile them? You know, they're, they're doing something that's wrong on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, it's not what goes into the mouth that makes a man impure. It's what comes out because it shows what's going on in the heart. And so I think about this because as the word of God is implanted, this is really interesting if you follow the word play on word and speech throughout this book, it just shows how beautiful it is. But as we receive the implanted word, it should cause how we address others to change. Now, what does it mean to have a tight rein on your tongue? Because I've often heard people say, well, 
I don't say any lies. I always say what's true. Well, just because something's true doesn't mean that it's benefiting the hearer. As parents, we deal with this truth where we know that our kids, when they're young, cannot handle some of the harder realities of the world. I've just done a funeral for both of my grandparents in the last six months. Explain death to a four-year-old. Some of you have had tragedies in your families where you've had to explain to a child about their parent dying. Explain that. Or some of you have watched a family become homeless, a house burned down, a car accident. You watch families divorce, and a kid is too young to handle that reality, where the institutions that they thought were set up to make them safe are dissolved. So having a tight rein on your speech isn't just saying, well, I don't swear or I don't lie. It also means following Ephesians 4.29, what is good for the edification of those that hear it. I believe I've often encountered people who think they're following Scripture with how they should speak because they're just blunt. Anyone ever, you know, defend yourself by saying, well, I'm just saying how it is? Sometimes that's okay, and sometimes that's being rude. If we want to have pure religion, then our tongue needs to be bridled. And this is why I have the passage read this morning from Amos, which if some of you who are students of history, you know that that was actually part of Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. Martin Luther King Jr. studied religion. He actually had a PhD in theology and was a reverend, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And you see the call of the prophets continually go throughout his speech because we as believers can't just say, well, I have the right framing of everything. We need to hold our tongues, but also we need to make sure that we have religion versus religiosity. So this is where I think the saying of religion versus a relationship, the conversation comes into play. Our true faith isn't demonstrated simply by having a list of check marks. Did I read the Bible today? Check. Did I go to church this week? Check. Did I sing a song? Check. Did I give offering? Check. Did I go on a mission trip? Check. But true religion is not about the showing of your faith so that way people clap their hands. Not a showmanship, but rather it's how does your faith show in your works? Tight rein on your tongue and having a worship that is your entire life. Romans 12, 1 and 2 talks about don't be conformed to the ways of this world, but rather be renewed and transformed through the Holy Spirit that your life would be a living sacrifice. But what is a living sacrifice? Well, we are people of the faith that goes back not just 2,000 years, but we like to claim that our faith goes back to Abraham. What did God call the patriarchs to do? What did God call the kings to do? What did God speak through the prophets? To be just. And so the last question, of the, which brings the question then of justice. Next statement. We're not supposed to just have a controlled tongue, but we're supposed to look after the widows and orphans. So I got in trouble the first time I pre, uh, taught Sunday school over this because I made a, fra- I made a statement that the widows and orphans aren't literally widows and orphans. Now, that's a scary statement, but oftentimes we as Christians look for reasons not to follow Scripture. We look for the exceptions. This is not just widows and orphans is what I should have stated. Because 
Widows and Orphans is a stand-in for the statement of the people who no longer, a widow, have the means to take care of themselves or a, an orphan, one who is removed from the God-given structure to be taken care of. And so as Christians, we are called to watch over the widows and the orphans. Look at the start of the life of the church in the book of Acts. Look at chapters essentially 42 through 6. What was the job of the church? What did they do? They sold their property. They made a, community, a communal pool. And they took care of each other. And then chapter 6, with the creation of, well, some would say the creation of the deacon role, the question was, well, this group of widows says they're being taken care of, but this group says they're not. The early church, flowing from the beginning of it, they took care of the needy among themselves. Now, this is not just, though, an early church idea. I want you to go through and read all the verses that I have mentioned, which means you might need to take a handout because I'm not going to go through each of these individually. But a theology of the poor and needy in Scripture is that God takes care of them. Those who take advantage of them are going to receive God's wrath. And if you are a follower of God, then it's your duty to demonstrate his reality and take care of the poor and the needy among you. Widow and orphan, poor and needy, they are synonymous terms. So let's ponder this, though. What does it mean to take care of the widows and the orphans? What does it mean to watch over them? What is our job today in the middle of Illinois in the year 2023? I think this is something that we need to ponder more. This is something that we need to ask. Because if James says pure and undefiled religion is this, we need to wrestle with it. I think it is going beyond merely trusting in handouts. As in, I gave $5 to someone, I'm good, I, I, I took care of people. It goes to celebrating things like the shelf opening up. But I want this to be something that isn't, this year I figured out what it means and I'm good moving forward. If we want to really take care of the poor and the needy, Think about how the translations differ. Is it take care of or is it visit or is it watching over? The term is a repeated idea of having a watch over something. Kind of like the hunters have their little cameras set up all year round to know the patterns of the deer, to know when they should go out to shoot the buck. We as Christians need to be watching and having our fingers on the pulse, but not just complaining about the issue, but doing something about it. But something else here, the first bullet that I have, who watches over? Whose job and obligation is it to take care of the poor and the needy? Yeah, it's not just a, well, the... Elders of the church need to make sure this is happening. It's not, well, this one rich person should make sure it's happening. It's, this is the duty of the 12 tribes scattered amongst the nations. If you claim the name of Christ, this is your faith. I challenge you to read these verses and to come up with practical ways that we can meet this as a church. We have a committee called the Church Growth and Evangelism, and we have a deacon committee, and we have a trustee committee. All of them have as a subcategory of their job title of making sure that needs are met, whether it be physical needs, whether it be evangelistic needs, and it's not just a couple people's job to come up with ideas. This should bleed into every area of our life. This isn't where also something else that happens I often watch is someone has their way that they meet 
the needs of others and they say, this is the way. And then someone else has another way and they think that it's combating each other. No, I have the way to help the widow and the orphan. Why am I the way to help the widow and the orphan? Doesn't that seem silly? Let's be collaborative because this is a call to all believers to watch over and take care of the poor and the needy, to make sure that the widow who has lost the breadwinner is taken care of and the orphan who is left without help is helped. Something should be noted in 1 Timothy 5, Paul addressing the question of widows and families stated that if you are a child and your mother's a widow, this is your job too. As a family, are you making sure that your generation above you is taken care of? And then are you making sure that the family below is taken care of? And the church's job is to be watching to where those people are falling through the cracks. One of the saddest parts of coaching is seeing where in the community people fall through the cracks. But one of the most beautiful parts of coaching and being part of a church is watching when people aren't falling through the cracks anymore. So finally, though, it says, religion that is that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So what about, oh, I guess I didn't make that slide bigger. Don't worry. It's in the verse. What does it mean to be polluted by the world? What does it mean to be spotted by the world? What is this about? When we're polluted by the world, I don't believe we often recognize it. There's this video of this black cat that a family thought was just a black cat. And then they gave it a bath, and it was actually a white and gray cat. That cat was just so dirty, and the family was used to it being that color, that they didn't realize that that cat was dirty. We all grow up around sin in different ways, whether it be a broken sinful structure, whether it be a habit that our family has that we have that passes on through the generations, whether it be the content we consume and just the reality that we are sinners. As a coach, I've watched people with running form that has spanned everything. And one of the saddest statements that I've heard a coach make is, it was a college coach, and they had a sprinter. And this athlete was a mediocre, medium athlete for the coach, but had the worst form I had literally ever seen as a coach. And I was asking this coach, I'm like, why don't you change that athlete's form? Well, they've been running that way their whole life. And to change them now, all those supporting muscles that should have been strengthened when they were younger, they're probably just going to end up injuring themselves because what's weak is strong and what's strong is weak. As Christians, how do we know when our running form is cattywampus? How do we know when we're wrong? Cattywampus is an old word used by a Dutch lady that's called my mom. And for those in the back confused about it, um, looking at the perfect law, you see, oftentimes we consider our morality as in, am I better than fill in the blank person that I've found? But God isn't saying, well, keep yourself from looking like your neighbor. God is saying being unspotted or polluted by the world. Which means we have to look into the perfect law of liberty and actually change. Because how are we supposed to be representatives of the kingdom of God in the world 
showing them that there is something new, a new life given through Christ. If we don't look any different than the world around us. We need other people as well to show us where we are polluted and stained by the world. In the book of John, there's a statement that we need that we are in the world, but not of the world, as followers of Jesus. It's very easy whenever you're trying to push into the darkness to compare yourself to darkness. And that's not what we're supposed to do. So how do we keep ourselves unspotted from the world, though? Well, first we need to ask, are we spotted? A way to tell if you're unspotted from the world is to ask, how do I handle social media? Am I someone who likes to freely post my opinion? Am I someone who likes to use social media as an avenue and an outlet for just entertainment and wasting my life? Do I use social media as the way to gauge what's right and wrong in the world? Usually, what I've found is the more that we engage in media, the worse we are, and especially the more we engage in forms of social media, the worse we are. This is a dire warning to anyone under, I'm going to use an arbitrary age, uh, under the age of 75. Beware how much time you spend on your phone just scrolling. Because the numbers are in through all the surveys that one of the main reasons that kids aged 13 to 23 are hitting such severe depression and a mental health crisis is that if you follow from the year 2012, the uptick of hours spent on things like Instagram and Facebook where it's not reality that's being consumed. And then they're comparing themselves to something that's fake. How can we be unspotted by the world if all we do is consume the world's standards and the world's thoughts and the world's ideas? We have to be careful. It used to be those weird magazines at the aisle of the check out that people said, well, this is where all the stupid things are said. And now it's in our pockets. And I've yet to find many generations that are actually above wasting their time on Facebook and Instagram. So the other question then of how do we keep ourselves unspotted from the world is then, well, I can tell if I'm spotted by the world, but how do I react to conflict? That's a question that I don't like. I despise conflict. I run away from conflict. I I don't like it. But doesn't that show something about maybe my view of truth and God being able to prevail and people being able to actually talk or do something? How we react to conflict is a red flag or a green flag as to whether or not we've been spotted by the world, polluted by the world, or marked by the world. And then a subcategory of that is how often are we in conflict with others? Because if we're never in conflict, that means we're either running away or we're bullying up people. Or if we're always in conflict, that means that we're probably not pursuing the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is marked by love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And then the last question that I have is, how do we handle questions of morality? So not only the question of what is moral and what is immoral, but how do you deal with people who do moral and immoral things? How do we demonstrate truth and love? Do we believe there is morality? If you have lost the sense of there being right and wrong, you've probably become polluted by the world. But if you also believe that there is only a clear black and white, right and wrong, and you know it, 
and there's no place that you could be wrong on issues of questions, then you're probably also spotted by the world. The person who believes they're always right about every question, beware. But this isn't my go find the other people who are answering these three questions wrong. How do you handle social media? How do you react to conflict? And how do you handle questions of morality? This is my hold up the perfect law that gives freedom. And let that be the mirror that reflects. And then if you go to others, don't do it to ask them how they handle it. Do it to ask for their honest answer about how they see you responding to those questions. We're going to handle the elements this morning in communion. These are questions that are supposed to go into our heart as we do it. And so I'm going to pray. Do you guys have a song between? So we're going to pray, and the worship team is going to come up and lead us in a song, and then we're going to move into communion after that. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. May we be followers of it. Amen.